Welcome to the American Monetary Association's podcast, where we explore how monetary policy impacts the real lives of real people and the action steps necessary to preserve wealth and enhance one's lifestyle. Welcome to the podcast for the American Monetary Association. This is your host, Jason Hartman, and this is a service of my private foundation, the Jason Hartman Foundation. Today, we have a great interview for you, so I think you'll enjoy it and comment on our website or our blog post. We have a lot of resources there for you, and you can find that at AmericanMonetaryAssociation.org. That's AmericanMonetaryAssociation.org, or the website for the foundation, which is JasonHartmanFoundation.org. Thanks so much for listening, and please visit our website in enjoy our extensive blog and other resources there. It's my pleasure to welcome back to the show Daniel Ammerman. I'm a big follower of his work. I met him about three years ago, and we had him on the show quite a while back. And he talks about turning inflation into wealth. And with all this talk in the news about the debt ceiling and the huge, huge fiasco related to that, I thought it would be a good idea to have Dan back on the show to talk about that in terms of the current events and also some talk about derivatives as well. Dan, welcome. How are you? Doing really good, Jason. Thanks for having me. Good. Well, it's a pleasure to have you back on the show. So what are your thoughts on this whole debacle with the debt ceiling? (laughs) I I have a feeling I know what they might be, but I'll let you tell the listeners uh, at the same time I I hear it. What we're seeing with the deficit limit was more or less just the surface cover-up of the symptom of the problem. And what I mean by that is that when we look at the uh, deficits themselves, they're not the problem, of course. It's not the deficit limit being $14.2 trillion or whatever the number was, but the problem is the uh, astronomical rate at which the U.S. is racking up new debt. Well, I think it was John Boehner who said, he said, the problem is not the debt ceiling, it's the debt. And oh, I thought, absolutely. I thought that was a perfect, simplistic way to put it, but it, it's absolutely true. Absolutely. And to really understand what's going on, though, at the same time, we have all this discussion of jobs and unemployment, which is very un, uh, you know, appropriate. And as you may have seen, I believe the number that just came out is there were more layoffs in the last month than we've seen uh, in the last 16 months. So things appear to be getting worse there. But the real problem is what happened in 2008 not having been fixed yet. And what I mean by that is if you go back to 2007, uh, we were in a situation where the private economy was 65% of the total economy. And of that, approximately $9.4 trillion was the private economy. And that fell to $8.1 trillion in a very fast implosion, kind of associated with the events of September 2008, which was a drop of about 14%. In the private economy. Now, I assume you're going to talk all about the government economy as well. Absolutely. And, and you can't understand any of this as long as you fall for the illusion as it's usually presented in the financial press, that there's one economy, because that's what enables the deceit. You know, the, we, the way we usually read about the economy is the sum of both the private and the public sectors. Right, and the public sector has been increasing so quickly. It's scary. It's at a fantastic rate, and it's worse than most people understand. What happened was the private economy fell by $1.3 trillion in effectively a period of months, which by itself is depression with a capital D. But we did see that happen because simultaneously, the total spending by federal, state, and local governments rose by $1 trillion. So when we look at the two separately, we see this fantastic fall in the private economy. We see this fantastic surge in the public economy. But between the two, it was only a small drop. And the the heart of the problem that we've run into is that the private economy has never rebounded. So if you look at these current approximate deficit levels of about these fantastic levels of about uh, 1.5 to $1.6 trillion, and one way I like to explain that is if you took every household in the country and they ran an annual defi- a monthly deficit of $1,000 a month, 
that's equivalent to what's going on in the federal deficit right now. So as long as we have the federal government creating an extra trillion dollars a year on top of what was already a problematic deficit of about $450 billion a year in 2008, then we're going to be at this extraordinary level of government spending. And probably the, the, the best way of presenting this that I've worked out, and this is part of an article of mine that will be coming out tomorrow, is that if you compare the ratio of the private economy, that's what pays for everything, is the private economy, to the public economy. In 2007, there was a dollar and 86 cents in private economy for every dollar in government spending. By 2009, that had dropped to a dollar and 34 cents in private economy for every dollar in public spending. So we went from a little bit shy of two dollars in private economy for every dollar in public spending to not that much more of a dollar in private economy. And, and I believe the, the federal government's share of the GDP now is somewhere around 20 percent, isn't it? I don't even look at the federal government because you have accounting games that go on there because what happens is the federal government essentially creates or borrows money and then it passes it to the state and the local governments. Uh, without which the crisis would have been much worse. Right, right. It kind of reminds me of how Enron used to use SPVs or special purpose vehicles. Mm -hmm. and, and that's really what happens. It goes both ways where the, the federal government sends money to state governments, but then it also takes money from them in the course of unfunded mandates and, and regulatory burdens and so forth. So it's really hard to keep track of. You're, right. You're absolutely it, it, right. It's that's really federal spending, but it's not shown in the federal budget because it's, it, it's kind of of a transfer, so to speak. And, and then what makes it much worse than that is the amount of Federal Reserve spending uh, that's entirely off the balance sheets, never even authorized by Congress and so forth. But the way I prefer to look at it is total government spending, federal, state, and local, compared to the total economy. And it was 35% in 2007. It jumped up to 43% by 2009, and it's still at 41%. Oh my gosh, that is a mind-boggling number. I mean, this is what socialism looks like, uh, or maybe communism almost. <laughs> it's crazy. It, it's, a, it's a pretty amazing number, but it's the very heart. You, if you don't understand that number, you're not going to understand what's going on with the economy or the, the deficit limit, the hidden depression and so forth. I wrote an article at the end of last year, beginning of this year, called The Hidden Depression. And it's gotten a lot of circulation. And what I did there was I took a look at what's really gone on with unemployment, uh, which is something that, that most people are just not aware of. Uh, what the government has done is it's taken unemployment and it's split it out into three separate boxes. And those boxes are never added together. I've talked on the show many times about the discouraged workers falling off the unemployment rolls. I've talked about underemployment. I've talked about independent contractor employment. And, and you know, I know that one firsthand because when I, back when I owned a traditional real estate company that I had sold in 2005 to Coldwell Banker, I had many, many independent contractors working for me. And, and Dan, I can tell you, they show up as employed but I promise you some of those people, a year would pass by and they wouldn't receive a check. Yeah, that's been one of the uh, unfortunate side effects is the sheer number of real estate agents who've fallen far below the poverty line. And, and what you, what you but really need to understand, sure, and when people try and compare, like Paul Krugman, for example, he tries and compares, tries to compare the unemployment rate now, and he goes with the official numbers more often than not, to the Great Depression. And back in the Great Depression, people either had a job or they didn't. It was much more clear. You worked in, in industry then or, or you didn't work. Nowadays, there's this huge gray area of all this self-employed and independent contractor type people. The issue is when you take a look at those numbers, though, and we do what they don't do, which is if you look at official what's known as U3 unemployment, that's right now about 9.1%. Expectation is the next time it comes out, it'll be about 9.2%, which is bad, but it's a recession level of unemployment uh, rather than, say, a depression level. Now, if you go to what they call U6, which is as high as the government goes in its estimates, that includes uh, both discouraged workers and um, involuntary part-time workers. That's the engineer who has a part-time job working at McDonald's. 
that the U.S. government now counts as being fully employed. That takes you up to about 16.2% right now. But where the heart of the issue comes in with the deficit and with the debt is this artificial and very inefficient economy that the government has tried to create to cover up that uh, implosion of the private economy. If they stopped running those deficits, then the real state of the economy becomes true. Um, in an instant. And right now, the deficits are running about 10% of the total economy, which is a fantastic number. 10% of the economy is based on a, a bankrupt government borrowing what it can't pay back, or else just flat out creating the money through the Federal Reserve and effectively funding Treasury bond purchases. If, if that government deficit spending disappeared um, and 10% of the economy disappeared, at the very least, without including multiplier effects, we'd have another 10% unemployed right there. And that would take us to 26% of the economy, which is greater than seen in the very depths of the Great Depression. But it's just split out into these three boxes of official unemployment, the unemployed who aren't counted because they're discouraged or involuntary part-time, and the people who have jobs only because the government is creating money at a fantastic rate. And, and unfortunately, the government, although it can be an employer, it's a terribly inefficient employer and a terribly inefficient, if you will, broker. It, it doesn't create anything, and when you send it money, it largely wastes the money. <laughs> so It does. It, it's a very ineffective source. But that's not even the biggest problem. Yeah, the biggest problem that I see is that we're engaged in a cover-up. Yeah, essentially, we're taking these massive fire hoses worth of created or borrowed money, and we're blasting it at the economy in a very ineffective manner to create a semblance of having more employment than we have right now. But we're not fixing what really needs to be fixed. So what needs to be fixed? Which is the private economy. And, in the me and all that we're doing by spending these fantastic sums in order to cover it up is we're bringing forward the day where we collapse the value of the dollar. And once the value of the dollar is collapsed, that real unemployment that's been there the whole time comes out. The only difference being that you've wiped out everyone's savings in the meantime. Well, here, here's the thing that I really wrestle with when it comes to a dollar collapse or just further debasement of the dollar. It's the big issue of compared to what? I okay. mean, compared to what? Gold, silver, the Swiss franc? There is no place really in the world that, that precious metals are truly used as a currency. The Swiss franc is a sort of a sort of a symbolic currency in a way almost in that it's not widely widely traded. So the dollar's a disaster. I couldn't agree more. But the problem is what else are you going to do when you have the size of the U.S. military that is rapidly using up its resources, unfortunately? It just seems like the U.S., although it's a poorly managed house, it's a poorly managed house in a neighborhood of homes that are inferior, largely. Am I wrong? Please debate it with oh, me. Oh, no, I, no. I you're, you're, you're heading into an area where I have been in, in the years we've known each other uh, in strong disagreement with some of the other people who write in this area because what they recommend is effectively shorting the U.S. dollar against other currencies. And this is a great way of generating a lot of brokerage commissions <laughs> right? <laughs> um, in the short term. But the problem is that we're actually in pretty good shape compared to Europe at the moment. They've got even worse problems than we do. And it's a very dangerous strategy to try to do that as well because the central banks are liable to intervene at any time. Um, and when regulators intervene, they can very deliberately punish investors and speculators, uh, much like what happened with silver not too long ago where there were the four margin call raises in a very short period of time that temporarily knocked six dollars off the price. Well, we, actually, with silver, though, we went from about fifty dollars down to about thirty-five dollars. Yeah, I'm day. sorry. I, I, would, I was, was off a digit there. It was sixteen. I think yeah, the base yeah. was about thirty-four. Right, right. And, and that was in, the, in a period of just, what, a week or so. I remember when that happened. It was a yeah, real calamity. absolutely. And it was because the regulators changed the regulations in a deliberate attempt to destroy the speculator. So that's an issue when you're doing currency speculation as well. Now, when you say what really happens when you have a high rate of inflation, what happens is the savers get devastated. The average person gets devastated. Someone who's been spent, who has been for decades leading a productive life, working hard, making a net contribution to society, Saving setting money. that money aside as they've been told to do, and inflation takes it all away. And that's where the real damage is done. So the place that I've been focusing 
uh, that I've been recommending that people focus their efforts on are not complicated international plays where everybody's in trouble and it's hard to say what will happen at any one time with the exchanges and the traders and the markets and so forth, but the simple domestic plays where the more the purchasing value of the dollar in your savings is destroyed, the more your own real wealth grows. And what are those plays? I mean, I know that you and I are both, or at least you were, and I haven't talked to you in a while, a, a fan of using long-term fixed rate debt to have that debt become debased by inflation. I actually coined a phrase around that, and I don't know if you use this one too, but I call it inflation-induced debt destruction. Yep. Um, and when I read your work, Dan, and I've been following you for a long time, it, I, I, I'm just in so much agreement with what you say. It's amazing. Some Sometimes I recommend that that people read your work and, and follow your work, and of course we're going to ask you to give out your website for the listeners. And then they they send me back one of your articles and they say, Jason, this is exactly what you've been saying. And I go, I know, Dan is uh, he, he's he's like my my kindred spirit. It's amazing. Well, let me get a little more, maybe even use a little bit of a metaphor to answer that. What I really like is the combination of a hard asset that generates a cash flow. Because when you have a hard asset that generates a cash flow, unlike let's say gold or silver, you can borrow against it if it's considered to be a reliable cash flow. Or I should say you can usually borrow against it. You know, at the height of a credit crisis, you can't. But typically, you can borrow against it. And uh, think of it in this terms. Let's say that you're in a valley, all right? And you know a flood wave is coming down the valley. And the floor of the valley is covered with sand. And around you are all these other savers and baby boomers and so forth. And everyone's building their sandcastles out of their savings and conventional investments in dollar terms. And you know that what's going to happen as an almost inevitable result of what's going on with debt and the deficit and Social Security promises and so forth is there's going to be this, this wave of inflation come through and it's going to knock away all the sand or a good piece of it. Now, for me, the ideal strategy is you get yourself this great big boulder that's not going anywhere. And you pay for not all of the boulder. I don't recommend that people take chances, you know, particularly with retirement savings and leveraging too far or anything, but with a controllable debt burden that you're very comfortable, even in a very poor scenario that goes on for years where you're going to have enough money coming out of that property to cover the debt service and the mortgage. You more or less surround that boulder with sand, where the sand is the prudent level of debt that you took on to buy the boulder in the first place. The tidal wave or flood wave, whatever you want to call it, comes down the valley. It wipes out the sand castles all around you, and it washes the sand around your boulder away. And what you're left with is a much bigger boulder exposed than what you started with. Ah, that's an interesting metaphor. And and what you're saying, the boulder is a piece of income property. It's a piece of rental real estate, right? It has two things in common. One of them is a tangible asset, and one of them is that it generates a cash flow. And because it's a tangible asset, while there's never absolute guarantees, the odds are it's going to maintain its value to at least some extent if we do have an, uh, a high rate of inflation in the future. And because it generates a cash flow, if you borrow prudently against that, you have the money to pay the debt on an ongoing basis as that debt is wiped away. So that's a pretty potent combination. And then you're left with both the asset, most of the value of the debt's been wiped away, and you have that ongoing cash flow coming in as well. Now, in an inflationary environment where at the same time you have credit destruction, though, and higher unemployment, the debt will be wiped away. The debt on that income property will be wiped away, which is great. But what happens to the value of that property, Dan, vis-a-vis other assets? Maybe I don't want to say value, or maybe you want to distinguish the value in real terms and nominal terms. You're welcome to do that. But uh, maybe maybe I don't want to say value. Maybe I want to say price of the property. I'm not sure which. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's a complex we, we, question. We, we, really. we, don't have, we don't have nearly enough time to cover this. But my own background is in um, institutional finance. Uh, Years ago, uh, besides financing many billions of dollars worth of real estate, um, I also used to uh, structure what were known as synthetic securities. And it's how in real terms the the major wealth in the world is actually invested. And a, a problem in the personal finance world is that people focus on what you were just talking about, which was asset value. And 
the institutional world at the highest levels takes a different perspective, and it focuses not on the value of the asset, but the value of the differential. You're actually indifferent to the value of the asset. All that matters is the difference between the value of that asset and the value of the debt that was taken on to finance it, because that represents your equity portion. So if, let's say, the value of your asset drops 40%, if you take a conventional personal finance perspective, you say, that's a disaster scenario. My gosh, look at what just happened to me there. But let's say that we're looking at this in inflation-adjusted terms. And that's what really matters. And that's what the approach I take and look at all investment alternatives is I do something few people do because most investments can't handle it. You look at everything in terms of after inflation and after tax. That's a deadly combination for a lot of investments. But when you take a look at that perspective and you say, if in inflation-adjusted terms, the value of that hard asset fell by 40%, but the value of the debt used to finance it fell by 80%, then you haven't taken a loss. You've taken a fantastic gain. You're playing the differential. Exactly, playing the differential. It's really an arbitrage. And one of the things that's really interesting... It, it, it's a hard arbitrage for people to understand because yeah. they're used to thinking just in asset terms. And it's hard to get your mind around, it's okay if your asset plummets as long as your liability plummets more in real terms, inflation adjusted. Absolutely. And that's a, that's a very good way to put it. It is amazing to me in working with real estate investors that I find sometimes people are complaining, but they're actually winning and they should be celebrating, but they just don't know how to properly keep score, do they? And the point of the matter is, as you and I have talked for quite a while, and in fact, the real estate scenarios that I was running and still run called for substantial deflation in real estate. And you know what I would show to people, and this is still very much true today, is if they bought a property and it went down sharply in market value in the first several years, that it could be one of the best things that could happen to them long term. So long as that property is throwing off the cash flow to make the payments. Because as long as it, do that, as it does that, really with property, and I'm not a flipper. I don't think you are either. You're working with long-term values there. If you're not approaching this from a short-term flipping perspective where the play is all in the dollar value, what happens there is that if you're playing for the long term, what matters in the short term is not the value of the property so much. Because really, when you look at the total amount of debt and so forth, you look at a variety of other factors that I discuss in my books and DVDs, there's a very high chance that we have a high rate of inflation coming ahead of us. And that's going to lift those property values, regardless of what's happening with real values right there. The key is what, where your short-term coverage is coming from. And right now, we're looking at falling vacancy rates. We're looking at rising rents. We're having more and more people enter the rental market. So if we're comparing the size and the likelihood of our cash flow coming in versus the cash flow going out, we're already, if you're focusing on that factor, in a very positive real estate market even today. But people don't see that. I know they don't. And people see the asset value falling, and they're saying, oh, I'm getting annihilated here. Well, no, you're not. Not if you're in there for the long term. In fact, it's just a, a strategic opportunity to acquire even more real estate, you could argue. Yeah, really interesting. Well, Dan, let's wrap up on the, a little discussion about derivatives, because you made a prediction back when I met you and attended your event back in 2008 in Newport Beach. And that prediction has uh, largely come true, hasn't it? It has. It has, and it, it kind of introduced uh, a principle that I think has really worked out well. Um, I used to, and I hope you don't hold it against me, this was back in the 1980s. Um, I, I was one of the leaders in structuring derivative securities, um, and I, I found an honest living after that point. Uh, long <laughs> but, but I understand how they work. I understand very well how they work because I used to create them. And what I had predicted to you in, in early 2008, well before the crash in September, was that the derivatives market was almost inevitably going to be destroyed, it was going to crash, or at least would attempt to do so. And I was one of a minority of people who were uh, talking about that. But the really essential point, as you might recall, is I said that wouldn't be allowed to happen. There wouldn't be a meltdown. There would be a bailout that the government would do of the large banks that would require the creation of money without end that would lead to massive government deficits and eventually to the point where the Federal Reserve was creating money out of thin air 
to fund those massive deficits, which is exactly where we are today. And uh, the key point that I've been making is that there's sometimes people get in this in this mindset where they think, well, the whole world's going to collapse right here. Yeah, that does happen with society every now and then. But more often, you have to anticipate what the counterpunch is going to be from the people holding the power to try to keep from losing that power and losing that wealth. And unfortunately, that's where we're all stuck in right now. It's, it's the bailout rather than the crisis itself that has dominated economic events for the last three years and still is. And that's what we need to be investing for. That's a really good point, Dan, because it seems that, and I'll, I'll criticize especially the gold bugs on this one, it seems that they're always putting forth these disaster scenarios, these societal collapse, uh, survivalism, etc. I, I think there is some validity to that. But my criticism is this, is that they talk about all of the reasons this will happen, and they outline them and, and do that very well, but they never talk about the counterpunches. For example, with the precious metals people, they never talk about GATA and the concept of gold price manipulation. You talked about it in the silver market just a few minutes ago, but there are always countervailing factors and counter punches that are done specifically by the powers that be that really have a huge impact on these things. There certainly are. And that is part of the reason that, um, and I don't want to, to knock gold bugs by any means. I have a lot of readers who are heavily invested in precious metals, and I do include some strategies, um, and this has been some of what I've been doing since you and I have last talked, uh, that very heavily involve precious metals. But the, um, the difference is that if you risk everything you have on one vision of the future, and that vision doesn't come true, you just lost everything you have. So what I like to have and what I recommend that people have is a vision that, in, that where you're prepared if there is, let's call it a societal breakdown, but you're also prepared if there isn't. Because the other big issue that's been coming out, and it's been a hot buzzword over the last few months, and I don't know if you've read a recent article I did on that or not, it's financial repression is kind of the other path that we go down. Um, and it's, in some ways, it's the direct opposite of the usual gold approach. And I would say in many cases, it looks unfortunately more likely to me in some ways we're going down this approach, this initial meltdown approach. And that is where by law, the government, because it has messed everything up, takes ever greater control over money and what can be done with money and so forth. And if we go down that route and you're in a, an investment the government doesn't approve of and you've got everything you have in that investment, uh, the government can pull the rug out from underneath you at any time. Well, it's kind of like being a bondholder in GM, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Look what happened to them. So very good point. So, so there's a really good case to be made for structuring a flexible strategy that handles either meltdown or repression. Very good way to look at it. Well, Dan, give out your website, if you would, so people can learn more. And do you still have your reading course available? I really enjoyed those. Those were fantastic. Uh, the website is Daniel Ammerman, A-M-E-R-M-A-N, dot com. And yes, I now have uh, a new version of the Turning Inflation into Wealth uh, mini course available. It's uh, basically a free book. Uh, that's delivered to you uh, at a rate of about two chapters a week once you subscribe. And that is a fantastic course. I love it. I've recommended that a lot of my listeners take advantage of that course, and I'd really encourage everybody listening today to make sure they get a hold of that. Dan, thank you so much for being on the show. Any uh, final remarks you'd like to make? No, I think that took care of it. I sure enjoyed it. All right. Appreciate it. Thanks a lot, Jason. The American Monetary Association is a nonprofit venture funded by the Jason Hartman Foundation, which is dedicated to educating people about the practical effects of monetary policy and government actions on inflation, deflation, and personal freedom. Our goal is to help people prosper in the midst of uncertain economic times. This show is produced by the Jason Hartman Foundation, All Rights Reserved. For publication rights and media interviews, please visit www.hartmanmedia.com or email media at hartmanmedia.com. Nothing on this show should be considered specific personal or professional advice. Please consult an appropriate professional if you require individualized advice. Opinions of guests are their own and the host is acting on behalf of the Jason Hartman Foundation exclusively.